the Rotary Club, the Peace Corps, and the Nobel Prize have all influenced my journey back to Africa. The Rotary Club. My father was a member of the Rotary Club, and every summer we would host foreign students in our house. And one summer we hosted a woman from Tanzania. And I was very young at the time, and I don't remember very much, but what I do remember is her vitality, her joy for life, her energy, all expressed in this beautifully, brightly colored, traditional clothing, the songs that she would sing, and the dances that she would do with my sisters. The Peace Corps. I was not a Peace Corps volunteer, but my brother was uh, in Ivory Coast, West Africa. And I visited him the summer before I began medical school. And we traveled from Abidjan all the way up to Ouagadougou in Upper Volta. And along the way, we stopped at health clinics and medical centers. And that was the first time that I saw the healthcare system in Africa, the Nobel Prize. I certainly have not won the Nobel Prize, but I was very fortunate to have a mentor who was a Nobel laureate. Dr. Frederick Robbins won the Nobel Prize in 1954 for developing tissue, tissue culture methods for uh, growing polio virus. This ultimately led to the development of the polio vaccine. Now, Dr. Robbins was an advocate for global health, and he urged me to become involved in the em emerging epidemic that was sweeping across Africa at that time. So about a year later, I found myself in Uganda, in Kampala. Now, Uganda was emerging from 20 years of civil war. The war had decimated the country decimated the infrastructure and diminished the governance of the country. When I drove from um, Entebbe Airport to Kampala City, it looked like a war zone. In the last few kilometers, as we rode into Kampala, both streets were lined with caskets for sale. It w the m my memories of that time are etched in black and white. The Ugandans recognized that they were in the midst of a war within a war. And they were fighting a new enemy, an enemy that was invisible and immortal. And that enemy was HIV. And HIV had consorted with a very old enemy, and that was tuberculosis, to create an epidemic within an epidemic. And my job on that trip and subsequent trips was to understand the interaction between HIV and TB. And by studying that interaction, I would develop better ways to take care of tuberculosis in HIV-infected patients. So my colleagues in Uganda and I, over the course of subsequent years, in rapid succession, learned that one in 30 HIV-infected individuals developed tuberculosis within one year. We learned that two of three TB patients in the hospitals were HIV infected. We learned that the standard treatment for tuberculosis, the African regimen, didn't work very well in HIV infected persons and was associated with high levels of toxicity. We also learned that one out of every four uh, uh, TB patients with HIV died within a year, even though they got the best treatment for tuberculosis. And uh, after a year, their mortality rate went up even higher. So we learned that HIV conferred the greatest known risk for tuberculosis and that HIV exacerbated or augmented the severity of tuberculosis. I want to pause for a minute and think about those numbers and those statistics. With every uh, trip that I've made to Uganda, I've been reminded that behind those uh, lifeless, cold statistics is a story of human suffering. And those stories are usually about the struggle between life and death. It's about the courage to face a new diagnosis and the fear of dying from that disease. It's about the hope that there will be a cure and the utter desperation that there is no cure. It's hard to work in a setting like that and not be affected. And that certainly happened to me 
I began to question my overall approach. I began to question whether it was best to optimize treatment of the individual patient um, and whether that would ever reduce the burden of tuberculosis in Uganda or in Africa. I began to question whether the tuberculosis, the disease, was the problem or whether it was the epidemic of tuberculosis that was the problem. I know that sounds like a, uh, a fine distinction or a semantic distinction, but I think there's a profound difference in the priorities that, that uh, follow. If tuberculosis disease is the problem, then we need better diagnosis and better treatment. But if the epidemic of tuberculosis is the problem, then we need to learn how to prevent tuberculosis, how to prevent the next case from happening. Now, following that line of thinking, I, um, I uh, articulated something that I call the replacement principle um, of tuberculosis. And what that means is that if you have a tuberculosis case who is uh, infectious, if at any point in time they transmit the disease to someone else, then overall you haven't made a dent in tuberculosis. The number of cases remains the same. Now let me give you an example of how this might work. Um, in some of my studies, some of my projects, we studied tuberculosis in African households. And we made the diagnosis once in a man uh, who had active tuberculosis and HIV infection. He was a father and a husband, and within a year, he died of his disease. One year after he died, his oldest son presented to our clinic with tuberculosis with the very same strain that his father had. That's the replacement principle in a family. Now, I want to illustrate to you how the replacement principle might work in a population. And here I'm going to use a mathematical simulation that was uh, developed with my colleague Andreas Handel. And on the left, what you see is a hypothetical population. The green figures are healthy people, the red figures are the tuberculosis cases, and the white lines represent the social connections between folks. And as you can see in the graph on the right, the number of cases remain relatively stable. They don't go up too much. They don't go down very much. That's the replacement principle. One case of TB is giving rise to another case of TB. But the epidemic or the problem still remains. Now, imagine if in this population you were to, uh, HIV were to begin to infuse. You'll start to see the number of TB cases increase. And why is that happening? Well, each case of tuberculosis is now giving rise to more than one case of TB. And as a result, we have an epidemic. And you see this emerging with the increasing numbers in the red line on the right. And you see much more red on the screen than you did before. Now, if there were some way to prevent the next case of tuberculosis, you'd be able to drive down the number of cases you'd be able to take control of the epidemic. And in this setting, one case of tuberculosis not, is not even replacing itself. And if you keep this program in place in that community, over time, you'll eventually see the epidemic go to extinction or you'll eradicate the infection. The beauty of this approach is that all tuberculosis cases are affected. HIV positive and HIV negative cases come down. And that benefits the entire community. Now, what does uh, tubercul tuberculosis look like in the world today? On this figure, um, on, I'm showing the number of tuberculosis cases reported to the World Health Organization in millions from 1990 to 2010. And as you can see, the number of cases increased from 1990 to 2000, from about 7.5 million to about 9 million. And from 2000 to 2010, the number of cases of TB remains relatively constant, maybe comes down recently in the last year or two. But in my interpretation, this is the replacement principle on a global scale. 
we haven't made any progress in controlling tuberculosis over the last 10 years. And we have to start examining why that might be the case. So you may wonder, how can we apply this uh, replacement principle to design intervention strategies that would prevent tuberculosis? In order for me to answer that question, I need to tell you a little bit more about the natural history of tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis is spread through the airborne route when someone with the pneumonia coughs. And um, uh, patients with tuberculosis often begin coughing three, four, five uh, months before the diagnosis, sometimes even up to a year before the diagnosis. And what's happening during those, that period of time before uh, diagnosis is made and treatment begun is that they're actually spreading the bacteria to their family, to their friends, to their coworkers, and to even, even to casual contacts. What they're doing is they're creating the next generation of tuberculosis cases before they even get the diagnosis made. So... Um, once an individual um, is exposed to tuberculosis, there are really two stages of the infection. One is what we call latent infection, when the person has the uh, bacteria in their body, but they're asymptomatic and otherwise healthy. And then the other stage of the, of the infection is tuberculosis disease, and that's the pneumonia. That's the, the part when people get, can get very ill. Now, about 10% of people move from the infection stage to the disease stage, okay? So now, I think uh, you have everything you need to know to identify the target points that may be effective in preventing the next case of tuberculosis. One target point would be to interrupt transmission. A second would be to prevent latent infection from going on to disease. The third would be to boost immunity somehow. I'll give you an example of each one. Now, to interrupt transmission, if there were some way to shorten the duration of time that someone coughed and that someone uh, was transmitting the bacteria, then you would reduce the number of new infections and thereby reduce the number of future cases. So uh, what we can do is work with communities to make the diagnosis of tuberculosis earlier and begin treatment at an earlier phase, thereby shortening that duration of infectiousness. In terms of preventing the progression of tuberculosis infection to disease, we have treatment that if, if you treat the latent infection, you can actually reduce the risk of tuberculosis by up to 70%. We use that as a mainstay here in the United States, but it, it's not used widely around the world. Now, in terms of boosting immunity, there is a vaccine called BCG that's used to protect uh, against tuberculosis. It's mostly effective in young children. Uh, it seems not to be very effective in adults. So we certainly need a better uh, vaccine that we can use in adults to boost the immunity and prevent the development of disease. Well, with all my emphasis on prevention, I don't presume to diminish the importance of treating individual cases. We have an ethical and moral responsibility to do that as a civil society. Uh, and it's also a key element, an essential element in controlling the epidemic. But the challenge of uh, the control of tuberculosis is as urgent today as it was 10 years ago. And it appears to me that treatment alone is not an effective strategy. I believe that we need to reframe the problem so that the epidemic of tuberculosis and not TB disease itself becomes a priority. I believe that we can achieve a greater good by preventing the next case of TB and thereby safeguarding the entire population, HIV positive people, HIV negative people, men, women, and children. Uh, little did I know that when I met 
a Tanzanian woman, or that when my brother joined the Peace Corps, or that when I shook the hand of a Nobel laureate, that I had embarked on a journey to Africa that would bring me to where I am today. And I'm here to say that it's only just the beginning. Thank you very much.